to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham, coming at you today nearly live from Ottawa, Ontario. And one of the things that we really like about the show, and, and I think the site in general, is finding new public history projects that maybe aren't being done by historians or people who, who work in history on a daily basis. And we got a really fun one for you today. And joining me is the founder of Northern Army, Ryan Anderson. Welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks for having me. So first of all, what is Northern Army? Before we talk about the project specifically, uh, what, what's Northern Army? What do you guys do? We're a creative agency. We focus a lot on uh, digital design and branding. So for some clients, we'll build... Uh, interactive experiences and products. Uh, and for a lot of uh, clients, we actually do logo and identity design. So, so in talking about branding, like, are you coming up with concepts or are they coming to you saying, this is what we think and you're sort of putting it into practice? Well, it's a little bit of a combination of both. You know, one of the things that I'm fond of saying is that the actual design of a logo is really only the last 20% or so of, of the project. A lot of the work uh, and what the difference between a good logo and a bad logo is not necessarily the, the skill of the designer. It's the questions that you ask along the way. Mm-hmm. Design is all about restrictions. And if you don't have the right restrictions going in, then you're not going to have a good final product. And obviously you want a logo to reflect a company's purpose, right? Mm-hmm. Or a company's sort of mindset goals. And, and how difficult is it to sort of de- design something that really speaks to what a company does? It's something that, that is uh, always, a, always a challenge. And, th- and that's where the skill of the designer comes in, being able to kind of parse that information and parse those restrictions and those answers into something that represents that, that, that vision. But, you know, in most cases, the hardest part is really getting to the root of that story because a lot of uh, a lot of times people that uh, the people that are are redoing the brand don't necessarily know themselves and we have to kind of achieve it together okay so so you guys are obviously very familiar with branding and and, Mm -hmm. and logos and stuff so so what's this new project that you're working on it's I took a look at it this morning and yesterday. It's pretty cool, but I'll let you explain what it is. Sure. I mean, essentially, it is a collection of curated collection of logos from Canadian companies and from Canadian designers. It's, it tends to be a lot from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So there's a lot of sort of retro feel to it. I think the main thing about it is that uh, we tried to create create a collection that would make people feel something when they see it. That we'd be able to get to that sense of nostalgia that you mm-hmm. that you get from old logos. How does that fit in with what the rest of like the rest of your company? I mean, you guys do branding and stuff, and, and but why then do you want to preserve these old logos? Well, to be honest, there there wasn't a real good business decision <laughs> behind this site. It was really a selfish thing that we. Uh, we wanted to do. It kind of started when we were uh, we were sending around the brand guide for the 1976 Olympics, uh, which is one of our favorite logos. It's just so clean. It's so it's so perfect. And their brand guide is is amazing. If you're a design nerd, you should absolutely check that out. It, I'm sure you can find it in Google. But we kind of started looking at a lot of these logos from that time and seeing a lot of the similarities and that that that. Maybe not in the aesthetic style so much as, as the the feeling that it evokes. And we just kind of wanted to collect those and in one place and curate a list of them. And, you know, we just decided let's, let's put it up on the internet and share it with people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the response to it was, to be honest, a lot more than I expected. Uh, people seem to really resonate with that. I don't know whether it's the nostalgia factor or or just the the, the design nerdiness in, in a lot of people, but people really seem to like it. Yeah, because that's one of the things I was wondering. You, you you mentioned this nostalgia factor, but do you think that maybe there's a deeper meaning to them for people? Like, I know you were on CBC Radio, the Ottawa Morning mm-hmm. Show, yesterday when we recorded, so last week when we posted this, but... And and one of the things that the host talked about, I think it was the host, she talked about the A&P logo. Yeah. And that the A&P logo had this meaning for her because she would go with her mother to A&P. And so it, it was this reminder of what it was. So it's even beyond a sense of nostalgia, there's a meaning of mm-hmm. that logo to her. So so is that really what, you, is that 
what people are responding to, you think, that it goes beyond just, oh, this is cool, mm-hmm. to it's it, it's a reminder of something in their past, and there's this in, inherent meaning for them. I, I think so. I mean, uh, that's kind of the nature of a logo. It's really, it's an empty box that you, know, f- you fill with meaning over time. In my own case, I think the, the CN logo generates that same kind of uh kind of feeling for me because we lived by the train tracks when i when i grew up or just down the road and we'd walk down and i'd watch the trains go by and i'd always see this cn logo and to me i wasn't thinking of it as a national corporation at you know four or five years old Mm -hmm. i was thinking that's that's the train sign so whenever i see it i i am kind of transported back to that i think something about logos and something about their simplicity and their ubiquity evokes a bit of a sense memory in us, mm-hmm. uh, you know, kind of like when you smell your mom's perfume or something like that. There's there's just an instant kind of flood of memories that comes back. Yeah, so it goes beyond the brand. Oh, absolutely. Right. It's it's, it's something that yeah. It's a, there's a memory to it, mm-hmm. and it's not just oh, okay, that's the logo for you know Air Canada. Yeah. So that's that trip I took, and that's when I yeah. met this person, or that's when this happened. Right. So it's not. It goes way beyond. The actual thing it's representing, and I think that's that's what brands are about. I mean, uh, that A and P logo. I mean, I had that same reaction to it because that's mm-hmm. that's where we went went grocery shopping, and it's a successful brand because I look at that logo and I think fond memories of shopping with my mother on Saturdays. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think grocery store chain. Right. You know, that's yeah. that's the difference. That's between uh, a just a regular old logo and a logo that that is successful Mm -hmm. and you can't design a successful logo right out of the right out of the gates it has to be infused with meaning over time one of the things i noticed going through the site is that you have a lot of sports logos for example and Mm -hmm. and so the blue jays have been around for 30 whatever years and they've had five or six logos Mm -hmm. and and one of the things that it struck me versus something like say the a and p logo or even the loblaws logo is that those ones are have more longevity and they've mm-hmm. been around for longer. So do you think that that's, that helps the meaning of a logo? Is, is its ability to, to persevere over time and a company to stick with it versus changing it all the time and this rebranding to sell more merchandise or whatever? I mean, it strikes me that having a, a strong logo mm-hmm. can really build the brand a lot more than changing it. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the difference between Loblaws and Blue Jays, for for instance, is that Loblaws logo is so simple. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, it's just kind of a radiating L. That's never going to go out of style. And that's that's one of the things as a designer you need to think about when you're creating a logo. If you create a logo for 2014, in 20 years, it's going to look like it's 20 years old. Right. But if you design a logo that is that is intended to be timeless, it, it's going to last forever. That's that's why you have to be careful with things like design trends and you know what font is really popular these days. If you start using those in your branding design, it's going to be out of date in no time. And so that's the thing you have to be careful of. Is that something that, let's say, a client comes to you and? They have a really nice logo, but they say we want to rebrand ourselves. Is, is it something that at any point you might say, I don't think you need to. You have a really strong identity mm-hmm. here. Maybe we could work on some other aspect of your marketing as opposed to necessarily the whole brand itself. Yeah, absolutely. And and that, that's actually happened to us before where uh, a client came to us with a, a logo that they didn't really like, mm-hmm. but it was very solid and it was very recognizable. So, you know, what we ended up doing was a very small revision to the typeface. So it barely, barely even noticeable. It wasn't a huge redesign, but we kind of tried to talk them into keeping with that established logo that they've, they've been using for years. In another case, uh, it's a slightly different story, but a company came to us and wanted us to help them rename their company. Mm-hmm. And after probably about three straight days of meetings... Uh, we said, well, what's wrong with your existing name? And they went, well, actually, I guess nothing. And so we ended up making a small change to the name as opposed to a big sweeping change. And, you know, not to say we sold them their own name, but, you know, we kind of helped guide their thinking in a way that, that, uh, that helped them maintain their identity when they were changing a lot of other things. 
Yeah, because it seems like, and again, going through the site and looking at some of these companies or, or sports teams that have had so many logos, mm -hmm. that they almost try to, they almost outthink themselves or outsmart themselves. It's like it's this reminder that being simple and being consistent is good, especially in a company. You want consistency. Like the, the places where I go and the places that I continue to frequent, they're consistent and I know what I'm going to get from them. And that's why I go there. And the logo can speak to that. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And I think there are times where you might want to rebrand, where you might want to throw off a certain aspect of your history. Mm -hmm. You might want to modernize. Uh, you know, IBM is an example of a company that's changed quite a bit over the years, but their business has changed considerably mm -hmm. over the years uh, from, you know, typewriters to computers. Mm -hmm. So in, in cases like that, where you're an evolving company in that way, I think it makes sense. But the idea that you're going to just kind of rebrand a company on a whim or because somebody doesn't like it or because a board member doesn't like it you have to have a really good reason to to redesign a logo it can't be something that you just do casually now one really good reason to redesign a logo is it becomes offensive over time mm -hmm. i there's a the washington redskins controversy uh, Mike Kamado has written about this for the site. The Cleveland Indians is one that doesn't get a lot of play, but the logo is very offensive when you yeah. look at it. And, and in Canada, those indigenous logos tend to be associated with oil and gas companies. Mm. Uh, I've noticed. And there's one on the site, like the Mohawk oil yep. logo. Are there any other ones that you've found that maybe... You don't have to name them if you don't want to, but ones that you've seen and said in 2014, if these people came to me, I would definitely suggest a redesign because you can't you can't do this now. It's it's just offensive. I mean, there are definitely logos like that out there, and, and it's kind of interesting to to look at the evolution of a uh, symbol being offensive. Mm. Uh, I mean, if you look at the swastika before you know in the 20s and 30s. There was no association uh, that with with that kind of evil that we have right. now, and as a matter of fact, it was a symbol of good luck in a lot of different cultures, and it was one that uh, was used in a lot of American propaganda before the Second World War. So, you know, obviously things like that need to change over time. But I, I think that, especially when we look at that era that we've kind of semi accidentally focused on, that sixties, seven, and eighties uh, in Canada. We had that a certain kind of aesthetic that didn't really allow for that sort of thing. That didn't really allow for you know the the portrait of a of a native warrior or something yeah. like that. That that would become offensive over time. Mm -hmm. It was very geometric. It was very very simplified. Mm -hmm. I mean, so is the swastika. But right. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know the, the the chances of something like that being adopted by you know something evil or, or, or offensive is a lot smaller. You know, mm -hmm. if, you, if you look at, uh, you know, the Confederate flag, yeah. that's an offensive symbol to a lot of people. But in and of itself, it's not an offensive symbol. It's offensive because of what it represents. Right. So, I, you know, I, I don't think... I think it's absolutely something that you have to be cognizant of when you're designing a brand. You have to be aware of the values. You need to know what is going to offend people or what is going to become offensive over time. Actually, one interesting example of that is the the accessibility icon, which oh, yeah. everyone everyone knows. It's on you know the parking spots. It's on yeah. signs everywhere. It's on 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 washrooms, and that's an international standard. And there's actually a body that is lobbying to update that logo so that it it looks less helpless, mm -hmm. uh, so that it looks more active. It looks the existing logo uh, of the person in the wheelchair looks like they're being ready to be pushed, whereas their revised version of the logo is a little bit more independent. It looks like it's in motion. It looks like it's moving forward. So things like that, there, there are definitely sensitivities that we have to be aware of as, as designers. Yeah, and the one that really struck my eye, too, that locally, the new basketball team in town, when they came mm -hmm. out with the Tomahawks, mm -hmm. and that they were surprised that this, <laughs> that people d disagreed with this or that were offended by this. And like... It's, yeah, I, don't, I don't understand how they came to that yeah. conclusion that no one would be offended. And they said, well, it's a basketball move. Yes, okay, it's a, it describes a dunk, but the origins of that are offensive. Mm -hmm. You can't say, well, it's the basketball move. You've got to look at the origins of where that comes from. And it speaks to me this 
again, this notion of, yeah, things change over time. And, yeah, you probably could have called the team the Tomahawks Mm -hmm. in the 70s, and no one would have said anything. But over time, like you say, things change. and The times are different, and you have to to understand where you are and, and situate yourself in the context of the time. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it it goes beyond just, uh, you know, the question of who am I going to offend or, Mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, worrying about that, that level of thing. It is about fundamentally, it's about how is this image going to be interpreted? Mm -hmm. And if that story isn't clear and it's, you know, from a business point of view, if it's muddied with people being offended or, or people being angry about it, then it's not a good logo. Uh, you know, it's got to be something that tells your story clearly. And unless, you know, part of your culture is being racist, uh, it's, you know, you have to, you have to be really cognizant of that. Yeah. If you were designing a logo for the clan. Yeah, yeah exactly. Then you could be racist in it. Then fine. Yeah. That's their Dif- thing. Different set of yeah. restrictions there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm assuming if they came to you, you guys would say no. I just, probably, yeah. yes. <laughs> um, now, you touched on this a little bit uh, with, with the logos that you found from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Is a bit of uh, the, the, the overall trends that you found. You said very geometric and, mm-hmm. and basic, uh, in, or I don't know, basic not in a negative way, just, just minimalist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah minimal. That's probably a better way to put it. Uh, have you noticed any other trends with, with some of these logos? I know, for me, I noticed there seems to be a lot of red. Mm-hmm. Uh, up on the site. Oh, the, well, I mean, we use the Canadian flag like crazy. You know, the maple leaf is in everything. And that's actually an interesting one because because we're in Ottawa and because a lot of association headquarters are here, you see that a lot. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember talking to a client about uh, their logo and they were kind of thinking about rebranding. And they uh, the one person was really, really against rebranding. Because they said, oh, you know, I, I show up in conferences and they go, oh, you're the one with the, the Canadian flag in the globe. I'm like, okay, well, that's every logo yeah, in yeah. Ottawa. So, you know, at a certain point, we have to set ourselves apart. You know, the maple leaf definitely indicates Canadian, mm-hmm. but there are other ways to do that in uh, in a more subtle way that that I think promote our Canadianness, if that's one of the things that you want to do uh, in a way that isn't sort of cliche or, Mm. or what can end up being trite after every single person in the world does it. I'm trying to think how, how do you do that? Well, I mean, there's uh, there, there are a lot of logos. Like if you look at a lot of the, uh, the Olympic logos, Mm -hmm. there's, there's a suggestion of a maple leaf there, but it's not in your face. Uh, There's a suggestion of that sort of Canadian aesthetic, but it, isn't as overt Hmm. you know as a designer part of your job is you know integrating recognizable symbolism but you can't rely on that as a crutch Hmm. you have to be able to tell that story without without cliches well the other thing i noticed too is that there seems to be a lot of green Mm -hmm. in in these logos too i mean so where do you think that comes from i mean is is that a color that you guys use a lot as well or, or because I don't, I can see the red, mm-hmm. uh, but you know, if you have the maple leaf and then green, like the red and green just strikes me as like Christmas. And yeah. Like, okay, I mean, do you really want that in a logo? But I noticed there was a lot of that. Well, I think color trends kind of come and go. Mm-hmm. You know, certainly red is going to be one that is always a, a common color in Canada because it's mm-hmm. our national color. I think during the 70s and 80s, green was a little bit more popular. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know, I don't know what the, the specific reason is. You know, if it was. If we're talking about a specific logo, there might be, it might be a bit more obvious. But I wouldn't say green is a, is a specific trend in Canadian design that 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 I've necessarily noticed. I know I notice a lot of them do incorporate that color, but yeah, I'm not sure where that comes from. Now, personally, do you have any like what are some of your favorite logos that you you've seen in, in putting this? site together oh we, we've got a lot of them um you know the 1976 olympics one is is great that's probably my favorite the tv ontario logo uh is, mm. is a really great one and again it's just it's so simple and it's you know it, it's it's if you look at it it's this kind of a stylized tvo mm. but it also looks like a person kind of crawling with a head <laughs> And there's, I remember seeing that when I was, you know, I was watching The Little Prince or Polka Dot Door or something like that and thinking it was a really weird symbol. And it, 
it it kind of gave me you know I, I was a little bit afraid of it mm. you know I, it it evoked sort of a feeling in me even not really understanding what it was mm-hmm. so that one that one's always been fascinating to me because there is a certain element of coldness to it and I think that is a common theme throughout Canadian logos is that sort of detached coldness which I suppose is fitting uh, for <laughs> for Canada but. Um, it's always something I, I've found found interesting. Um, if you look at a lot of these logos, if you look at some of the park signage mm-hmm. uh, in national parks, there's there's a definite sort of detachment from mm-hmm. it uh, that I find really really interesting. Detachment in that it's not very emotive, or detached in that it it's sort of maybe plain, and that you're, you're left to put the meaning on it yourself. I, th- I think there's an element of that, and I, and I think that there is. It's it's not interacting with you, in, mm. if that makes sense. It, it's more there to denote something, and it doesn't kind of follow with you, mm. if that makes sense. It's it's a little bit it's a little bit esoteric, but uh, <laughs> but uh, it's I, it's something I've found is is sort of interesting in a lot of these, especially very iconic logos. Mm. Is that different from things that you've seen internationally then? Like, like are there European or American mm-hmm. logos that you find more interactive? Well, the European style is actually very similar to the Canadian style. The, the Swiss school that was popular around that time uh, tended to be very geometric and used a lot of you know Helvetica, big, bold lettering. I think we kind of took that style and adopted it to be our own a little bit with i think thinner letter forms and more reliance on symbol less on type uh which i think might be actually part of the fact that we're, we're a bilingual country mm-hmm. but i mean i think if you look at a lot of famous american logos i mean it's really it's very subjective mm-hmm. but if you look at the coca-cola logo you know that seems very warm and inviting whereas if you look at the you know the the tv ontario logo to use the same example it's it's less so, right? It's, it's a little bit more detached. It doesn't doesn't say what it is mm-hmm. overtly, right? It just symbolizes. Mm. Now you, you mentioned bilingualism. Is that something that? Because I noticed this just occurred to me when you said that that a lot of the logos that are up there don't have that much lettering. Don't mm-hmm. have a lot of them don't have words. Is, is that something that you've noticed? Again, putting this together or just in your own work generally that. Companies try to avoid using language, mm-hmm. or at least words that aren't Canada, right? Words yep. that don't translate same for same. Yeah, it's actually a very tricky thing to do as a designer. Uh, it's one thing to have a symbol and a word, but it's another thing to have a symbol and a word and the translation of that mm-hmm. word being separated so it doesn't read as the same thing twice. Right. So... You know, I said design is about restrictions. That's a restriction that that often comes up in, in Canadian design, and it's one that is most easily solved by not putting words on it at all. Mm-hmm. So I think that is a bit a bit of where that that that's come from. Yeah, I noticed uh, I, we did the Northern Scene Week with the podcast and the site last year, and I don't know if they would call it a logo, but it was Sen, so it would have the accent over mm-hmm. the e. Uh, I think Northern and then Scene. Right, because you have to have both, but the only difference is the accent and the fact that you have to have the whole other word. Yeah, because the accent, I could see that as from a design perspective, being somewhat annoying. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it it definitely, it definitely is. Right. Um, Well, I find it it does take away from the aesthetic of it uh, because it clutters it, right? Like an extra word or an extra two words can clutter something. Yeah, I mean, there's there's ways around it. I've um, I designed a logo for for a company uh, a few years ago. Uh, where we actually kind of it, the the last word was media, uh, which is the same in French and English, but yeah. except for the accent. Yeah. And so what we ended up doing was taking kind of a an accent shaped chunk out of the e. Okay. So that if you were looking for that accent, you would say, "Oh, that's the accent." Right. But if you were English and not expecting it to be an accent, it was kind of a design choice. So, okay. You know, I, I I don't know if that's the uh, the the best solution to that problem, mm-hmm. but. Wherever possible, we try to we try to minimize what goes on a logo. We try to, like I said, we try to tell as much of a story with as little as possible. Mm-hmm. So it is a challenge to try to take 
a name that translates as more words than the actual name mm-hmm. uh, and try to turn it into something that, that tells a story without being distracting. Right. And Because well, for me as an Anglophone, a lot of the times, I'm just like, if you use the French one, that's fine. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, I don't, I don't care. If the difference is an accent or not an accent yeah. and the accent's there, I'm okay with that. And I think a lot of Anglophones mm-hmm. would be, or at least I hope a lot of Anglophones would be, because you can see, you still know what it is and then people in French... It fits with that as well. I mean, like it's like being on OC Transbo Mm -hmm. and you're going down the transit way and it's like Albert and Bank. And so they say Albert and Bank, Albert A. Bank. I'm like, do you really need both? Like, it's (laughs) the same thing. Like, it's not, I I don't, and and it's one of those things. It's not, it, it strikes me that maybe we're not being so much as bilingual as we're being two separate cultures of unilingualism hmm. and as opposed to actually bilingual that's an interesting point actually but you know i, I think it kind of goes back to your question about y- including things that might be offensive to people right as a company you want to be inclusive to a french audience which mm-hmm. you probably do in canada the the act of leaving that accent off kind of tells a little bit of a story oh yeah so i think that's that's something that has to be you have to tread lightly in that area mm-hmm. because while it may mean nothing to a certain person to have an accent or not have an accent, it it may say something a lot bigger mm-hmm. to somebody else who maybe feels like they're not included uh, on a regular basis. Right. So so me saying there's an, if there's an accent, that's fine. Mm-hmm. And I'm okay with it. Maybe someone who is new to the country and who's learning English and maybe doesn't know... Mm-hmm. French at all, yeah. like from a non-English speaking country who's here, maybe that would throw them off somehow and, and yeah. would be restrictive. Absolutely. And I, and I think that that's, that's a big uh, consideration for design wherever you are. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're coming up with a, a logo for a company, you have to make sure that it doesn't mean something offensive in another mm-hmm. language. You have yeah. to make sure that the name of your company isn't a, a slur in, <laughs> a, in a language that you've never heard of. Yeah. So there's a lot of, I guess... There's a lot of fact finding and there's a lot of testing that has to be done. And that's why, I mean, that that's the difference between a redesign of a major corporation, you know, that costs half a million dollars and you look at it and go, that much to make a logo? Uh, versus the rebrand of a small local company that might be five or ten thousand uh, dollars. It's the amount of due diligence that you have to put into mm-hmm. it. It's the amount of testing. It's the amount of stakeholders that are involved. Right. The actual design of the logo is slightly more expensive because you have to do a lot more versions, a lot more tweaking and, and things like that. But really it's the making sure that you're, that you're covered and that you're not uh, stepping on anyone's feet unnecessarily. Mm-hmm. Now, just getting back then to, to some of the, the logos, I'm curious as to where you found some of these because there's, there's, I wrote down a few that I really enjoyed. Men without hats is just phenomenal. Yeah. That's just, yeah. <laughs> that's great. There's the Vortman Cookies one, which is just a, a lady mm-hmm. standing there. It looks like a grandmother type yep. woman who's in red. Mm-hmm. Uh, I enjoyed that one. And then a couple that I'd never seen before. Um, Capybara Games, yep. which I'd never heard of. Uh, I don't know if they're still around. It looks like three pigs. Yeah. They're sort of intertwined. Yeah, I think they're capybaras, actually. <laughs> is that still It's like a, a guinea pig, yeah. Oh, that's an actual animal. Yeah, okay. yeah. There you go. And then the Japan Canada Food Systems Resilience Symposium. <laughs> I'd never seen that one before. That either. was pretty spectacular. It's like a flower kind of and it's different colors in it sort of yeah. going out. Almost like the old CBC logo yep. exploding out, but it, it's clearly a flower, yep. uh, which is pretty spectacular. So these things, mm-hmm. where are you finding them? <laughs> well, a lot of them are we, – we, we were just throwing out – logos that we we wanted to see on the site you know beaver lumber was one of them for me yeah. um that one's great and uh i know renee had a lot that he wanted to put on the site as well uh and we talked to a lot of our designer friends and and got suggestions from them mm-hmm. and uh what's then in some cases we were you know just looking for great canadian logos and came across some that we hadn't seen before but were canadian and designed by canadians and you know we just we had to include them because they were just too perfect even though they they didn't necessarily generate any memories for us Mm -hmm. but i think would for someone else and what's been interesting actually is since we've launched the site 
uh, we've got a lot of attention, uh, more more than I expected, and a lot of people have been emailing with their own suggestions. Uh, There's a whole thread on Reddit yesterday on, on their design <laughs> subreddit about nice. these Canadian logos that that we should include, and a lot of them are on our list. But you know, for some of these, they're so hard to find because they've been revised and revised and revised over time. And finding a high quality digital version of the original mm-hmm. is very difficult. In fact. Uh, you know, this this site was almost a year in the making. Oh, wow. In our you know off time, yeah. it was just a just a little side project. Uh, but a lot of the work that went into it was recreating versions of the logos that you know cleaning them up mm. from scans and uh, vectorizing and, and things like that. So it was a lot of sort of curation and restoration of of some of these images that we found online. Have you gone to say Library and Archives Canada pulled out? like the Petro Canada archive just to get some letterhead and maybe scan it that way. Is, is that, or has it been all digital? <laughs> no, but that's a really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's been all digital. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, I think the next step for the site, and especially now that we know people are so into it is to start finding some more information about the logos. That's, mm. That's an interesting thing for me because as much as we all recognize these logos and, the, and they're so, so pervasive, Everyone can recognize the CBC logo. Mm-hmm. You know, how many people can tell you that it was designed by Bertrand Kramer? Yeah, like, you know, it's, yeah. it, it's, it's a very obscure <laughs> thing. I mean, same thing with, with, with any logo. It's a very anonymous art form. Mm-hmm. You know, e- even we've even got a few logos from people from design studios who basically gave the credit of the design studio. They didn't have... Mm. Uh, you know who actually designed it because they couldn't even remember themselves so it's an interesting thing to be to be the designer of something that is so ubiquitous is so you know so ingrained in people's minds Mm -hmm. but nobody knows who you are but that could also be maybe somewhat that'd be kind of cool like you walk down the street you see this logo you're like i I did that Mm -hmm. and nobody knows it's sort of this almost inside little yeah, feeling, absolutely. Right? It's like this sense of pride. Yeah, and I mean, I think the designers don't sign their work. You know, there's right. no, there's yeah. no signature at the bottom of a website mm-hmm. or an annual report. So I, I don't think you get into it for for the glory. Mm-hmm. You know, my high school art teacher designed the Winterio logo. If you if you remember that, it's like the bullseye that says Winterio okay. beside it. So that I mean, that was kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. So you want you, you mentioned you want to maybe look at the history of these things a little bit more. Would you be looking at it more from the perspective of the people who are consuming the logos or the creation of the logo? I think a little bit of both would be interesting. But what I really want to get to is where we get to a point where at least most of these we have design credits on. Mm -hmm. Uh, We didn't include it in the first version because we just, you know, I think we know maybe about 5% of them. But I'd like to, you know, there's there's really interesting stories about this design of the CN logo, uh, which was designed by Alan Fleming. And just the discussion between the, you know, the head of PR for the railroad and this designer about how it came to be because that, that's what i find interesting about a logo is not necessarily the final project but their product but the thought process that goes into it mm-hmm. because a lot of times a logo can say something that you don't necessarily intend it to say so it's always interesting to see what what you were what the original artist or or brand manager or designer what they were trying to say right. most of these iconic ones i i you assume that it's one or two people who are doing it mm-hmm. as opposed to this committee and it goes through these different variations. You know, as the saying goes, there are no statutes to committees, <laughs> right? It's always this, there are individuals who are doing this. So yeah, each one probably has a really cool story behind it. Mm-hmm. And especially trying to understand if it's possible, what the person's intent was. Yeah. Because the intent of what the logo was probably isn't the way it was the meaning that was eventually attached to it. I know things that I've written, I've meant one thing and people have looked at it a different way and it's just the way people consume things. And, mm-hmm. and that dynamic would be really interesting, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a little bit harder to do today because I think a lot of these logos really do get put through the filter of a committee mm-hmm. uh, and some opinions 
get in, inserted into the, the, the creative brief or into the, the story that they're trying to tell that isn't necessarily the right thing to include, but just happens to come from somebody with a lot more influence than, mm. you know, say, a, a, just a stakeholder or somebody that gets interviewed. Mm. You know, it, it's, it's a scary thing to have a logo designed for you because you have to trust that this is going to last for as long as your company does, theoretically. Right. So, you know, a lot of what our job becomes is making sure that we really understand what the client is looking for and trying to project and then gaining their trust to the degree where we can say, yes, this is the answer. Don't worry. We're, you know, we're, we're going to hold your hand through this. <laughs> so, you know, that happens from time to time, but uh, it, it always results in a better, a better product than if it goes through a whole bunch of committees and mm -hmm. uh, focus groups. It's like the HBO model versus the NBC model mm -hmm. where HBO just hires people who they like, say, mm -hmm. go make your show and we'll put it on. Yeah. Whereas like NBC or any network TV, it goes through network executives and everything gets watered down to it's the same old stuff you've seen a thousand times before. And the creativity is gone. You know, there's a great saying by uh, uh, an American uh, ad guy from the 60s and 70s. I can't remember his name. Uh, but he said, I'd rather die, I'd rather deal with a tyrant than a committee. Right. <laughs> and I think that's that's true for anyone who works in this industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it just allows you to be creative. And, and especially in something like a logo where you want to be distinctive. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I think that a lot of people, when they're they're commissioning a new logo or they're designing a new logo is that you have these list of, of restrictions uh, that that are going to shape what the design is. And then it becomes a matter of prioritizing because you, know, you asked, how do you show that you're Canadian without a Canadian flag? Mm -hmm. And I think the answer is that you you act Canadian as, as a company. You know, <laughs> you, Your logo doesn't necessarily have to have a maple leaf or a beaver, but if you associate that brand with you know what, what we would consider canadian values even if it's not overtly symbolic of canada i think you start to infuse that meaning into the logo and it starts to uh it starts to take on that that flavor if you want right. like and i can see certain restrictions of let's like if you're uh the blue jays mm -hmm. you don't want the logo to be brown right like, okay that yeah, makes yeah. sense but to just say you can't do this, 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 or this, I mean, and, yeah. yeah. And, and like you say, I mean, the me, yeah, the meaning will come from the company. Maybe not the company. It'll come from the principles that the company stands for. Mm -hmm. And if they do good work and if they're, a nice, if they're nice to people, mm -hmm. then people will associate the logo with good things. Absolutely. Yeah. And if they, they treat their customers like garbage, that logo is going to mean garbage. Mm -hmm. It's uh, like when I see certain telecommunications companies' logos. <laughs> Who shall remain nameless? Yeah, so I don't get sued. <laughs> so you've you've mentioned it a couple times, but I, I want to get into this a little deeper. The reaction to the site this just launched. Mm -hmm. What has the reaction been? You mentioned you guys have gotten tons of feedback. Uh, what what are people saying? By and large, it's it's very positive. It's it's people are looking at the site and going, "Oh my god, this is this just brings back so many memories." Mm -hmm. It, it was surprising to us. In fact, you know, the, the day before we sent out, uh, I think we sent out two press releases about it. And I said, you know, this isn't going to get a lot of pickup. It's just going to, you know, we'll get a few retweets and a few likes on our Facebook page. Mm -hmm. And then I imagine it'll die off and it'll just be a pet project that we that we work on over time. But it got picked up by The Citizen and then it got picked up by CBC and then it got picked up by uh, a site called Design Taxi, which is a fairly huge blog in the in the design world. Mm -hmm. Fast Co-Design is <laughs> writing something about it. Slate tweeted it last night. So oh, wow. just things that, we, I mean, we had nothing to do with any of it. Hmm. But it, it's kind of taken on a life of its own. And I, and I think the reason for that is, for Canadians, there's that nostalgia factor. But for the... It's, it's been really popular in the U.S. too. Mm. And I think the, the, the thing there is that they're not familiar. So it kind of gives them a... Logos give us an insight into a culture in a really interesting way. Because they don't say anything about our history, but they also say a lot about our history. Right. You know, there's... Someone said that uh, ads are the uh, cave drawings of our generation. Mm. <laughs> uh, and I think there's some truth to that. And, you know, for, for someone to 
uh, outside of the country to look at the logos that we see every day, they sort of start to see the world that we see that is maybe slightly foreign to them if they've never been to Canada. You know, it's it's the little differences that are interesting when you go to the U.S. or when, when people from the U.S. come to Canada. You know, if there was a German version of this site, I'd be all over it. Right. Just to just to see that that kind of like, what's different there? What's what, what do they see every day? What's nostalgic to them? Do you think part of that is you know, your experience in design and designing things? Like if someone like me looked at an American version of this site, would I appreciate it in the same way? Because, you know, some of the subtle differences I probably wouldn't be able to pick up on. Mm-hmm. I would probably just notice that, well, there's no maple leaves in any of these. <laughs> and there's yeah. probably a lot less red. Right. Right. I mean, those obvious things. Would an American who's not in design attach themselves the same way Americans in, in design would? Or is it the sort of thing that you think that anyone can, can look at and really appreciate what they are? I, I don't think you necessarily have to be a designer to appreciate a collection of logos like this. You know, I think there, there's there's sort of a, you know, design geekiness and, you know, that design love has, uh, I think, become a lot more popular over the last little while. Even if people aren't designers, appreciating the simplicity of things uh, and the the form of things, I think, is, is, is becoming pretty common. And I think that if you're interested in the differences between a culture, I think it's an interesting lens to look at it under. Mm. But definitely, if you are a designer, you're going to appreciate it in a much different way. You're going to, you know, appreciate the the simplicity and and the you know the, just the way the forms come together and and the symbolism. But I think even if you're not a designer, I think you're going to come away with something. And and have you noticed any trends in terms of who's visiting the site? You mentioned most of these logos, 60s, 70s, 80s logos. Mm-hmm. Are, so are the people who are really expressing this excitement are they people who were growing up in that period or were they people who were young parents and had kids who's really getting excited about this site well i think the people that are most excited about it and i think there's a natural bias because we're in our mid-30s and so what's nostalgic to us would be nostalgic to a lot of people in their mid-30s so i think it's it's a lot of that generation that are, are are looking at it but what's been really satisfying is there's been a lot of uh, a lot of older people and a lot of people that that were actually involved in some of these mm. that are emailing us and 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 you know starting conversations with us about it, which is which is really nice. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, especially if you have people who were involved in the design or in the conceptualization mm-hmm. of it. To if the, even if they write like a little short post that you could attend, like stuff, stuff like that would be pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if we had the time, if I could make this my, <laughs> my full time uh, job, I, I'd love to have histories for every one of those logos and talk to the people that designed it and talk to the people that commissioned it to find mm-hmm. out, you know, did you like it when you first got it or did you think it was going to fail or did mm-hmm. you think it was going to be amazing? Did you realize it was going to be as, as long lasting as it was? Mm-hmm. So asking those questions I think would be really interesting to me so that's something that you would like to do but the way you conceive it now the future of the site is maybe building those over time finding more mm-hmm. logos is, is that how you envision it yeah we've been adding quite a few logos over the last few days since we've launched uh, a lot of people have been sending in suggestions some that we completely missed or had never seen before mm-hmm. and some that we had on a list and we just you know couldn't get around to retouching the versions that we had but I think that's our, our near-term goal. Then eventually adding the the designer credit for each one. Right. You know, those things that take a lot of research. Yeah. Uh, and then if we could eventually add stories to it, if we could have people send in the stories, if we could have people help us curate the, this, this kind of history of Canadian design, that would be amazing. But... Mm-hmm. We're kind of stuck with the uh, the reality that we we have clients that we have to <laughs> yeah. do work for, yeah. so it's going to be a slow burn. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's definitely something we're always going to be working on and, and expanding and, and making it into something better. All right, so let's let's send people to the the site. It is preserve dot northern army dot com. That's it. And people can search through the logos and, and take a look at, at all that fun stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the website for you guys, and just in general, Mm -hmm. northernarmy.com. How else can people get in touch with you? Twitter, Facebook, that kind of stuff? Yeah, we're we're on Twitter at Northern Army. uh, And if you want to send us an email about the site specifically, uh, it's preserve at northernarmy.com. 
And so you guys are, there's a long name for this, right? Like the preservation, what is it? The Northern Army Preservation Society of yes. Canada. Okay. <laughs> Where'd you come up with that name? Is that... Oh, it's a little bit of a nod to the uh, uh, sort of government letterhead, which is actually another really well-designed thing in Canada that really doesn't necessarily need to be. And, uh, you know, kind of taking that retro brown and yellow yeah. look. So yeah, that's, that's where that came from. Yeah, because the site the site is pretty slick. It it does look good. Oh, thank you. Uh, so so I did enjoy that. So did you incorporate yourselves as an official society? <laughs> historical society? Not yet. <laughs> ba- baby steps. <laughs> so again, preserve.northernarmy.com. Go check out all the logos. It's a phenomenal site. Ryan Anderson, founder and chief strategy officer of Northern Army. Thanks a lot for doing this. Thanks a lot. If you have any questions, comments for the podcast, historyslam at gmail.com, Twitter at Dr. Shawnee Fever. And if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.